Uh, we have another exciting day of a, a, a distinguished lecture series that we've been having. Um, we've had a lot of interesting people come through in a lot of different fields. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce an old friend and colleague uh, from my old stomping grounds. Um, Joe's career is, I'm sure, well known to many of you. Uh, and it's been an incredibly interesting career in terms of the kind of breadth and trajectory of fields that it has come. So he started out as an anthropologist way back when and kind of went in then into cognitive psychology and social psychology and was very much focused on the micro level issues and then kind of traversed his career through strategy. And when he and I met, um, he was actually becoming much more interested in the fields that I was engaging in terms of a more macro understanding of economic sociology. Uh, and so for me, it kind of just uh, was wonderful to have a colleague who kind of thought so broadly about so many different in fact, when we taught a doctoral seminar together once we both learned, we have this uh, secret hidden passion for paleoanthropology, which made the, made the, made the doctoral course very interesting. Uh, actually, I think he started the doctoral course with, uh, with a lesson in human evolution, which was fascinating. Um, so anyway, it's just, it's just so wonderful to have uh, uh, such a wonderful intellectual down here to, to talk to us about his new research. So without further ado, uh, Joe McCorm. Well, uh, it's, really, it's really great to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Daniel. Um, I want to talk about some work that actually Jim Wade and Scott Graff and I have been doing for uh, uh, several years now on uh, CBO Celebrity. And um, it's, it, we started out just doing a little project. Uh, we wanted to kind of understand a little bit about the, the, the effects of the media on its corporate governments. And, um, Jim has a long-standing interest in executive compensation. We kind of started talking a little bit about it, and uh, it's been an interesting project because it's involved. Uh, we've kind of followed the data, and there are some interesting things that we found in our data that kind of piqued our interest a little bit. And uh, we kind of have been snooping around, and uh, it turns out that there are a number of other papers, a number of other folks who've been starting who have studied who have started to study. <coughs> Uh, the effects of celebrity and media on CEOs. And uh, there's now actually probably 15, 20 papers uh, on this topic across a variety of literatures, finance, accounting, uh, management. And um, there's actually a number of little puzzles in this literature. And Jim and I and Scott were actually finishing up a little bit of a review paper on the literature. And, uh, and we wanted to kind of give you a flavor for some of our conclusions. But then uh, I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about a project that we just got going uh, within the last six, seven months. And uh, it's a, a project that kind of comes out of this uh, CEO uh, work, but it's in a different context. It's, we're studying um, UK parliamentary uh, MPs. And um, we, as you'll see, uh, this talk is about uh, the, the interesting puzzles have to do with status. And uh, we thought that as we kind of reviewed the literature on CEO status, that there are some problems with the government's context in corporations that make it hard to kind of tease apart certain things. We looked for another context, and it turns out that the MP second home expense scandal of uh, 2009 helps, it, uh, uh, helps to clear up certain causal relations. So I wanted to spend some time at the end talking about that. And I know a bunch of folks, uh, this talk has to do with strategy and leadership and ethics, and I know it cross-cuts a lot of different areas that I know that a lot of people here are interested in. And we're particularly interested in getting feedback uh, on the ethics side of things here, because I think that there's a side here that's uh, uh, kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, here's our topic, here's our focus today, superstar CEOs. And um, really, the, the uh, issue that we want to uh, kind of address it comes down to this. Look at Jack Welch. Now, this is from 1998, and if you can't see back there, it says, uh, How Jack Welch Runs GE, a close-up look at America's number one manager. Okay? And the issue that we want to address today, and in our work, uh, is look at his eyes, and look at his face. Take a close look. Now, is he happy, or is he sad? about being on the cover of this. <laughs> uh, and, and being labeled America's number one manager. I mean, that's a, that's a, a really a significant thing, number one manager in the 
United States. And uh, another way of thinking to concretize the issue is let's say you're sitting in your office and you get a phone call from Doug. And Doug says, you've just been um, given the number one teacher award in, at GWU. What's your feeling? Happy or sad? <laughs> And uh, I guess the opening, uh, the opening claim that we're making is that we probably shouldn't be clear about it. <laughs> because uh, this is a really significant uh, event, and, this, and recognition is a really powerful uh, motivator, but it has a very complex effect on social relationships. And that's what we're sort of trying to untangle here. And uh, the window, uh, uh, well, so it, 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 in our work uh, in corporate governance, um, there are uh, three different narratives, I think, in corporate governance. And um, one narrative is the relationship between CEOs and their top management teams and uh, boards of directors, just to place this in the literature. Uh, and there's a lot of work across a number of different fields looking at this relationship. But, um, we're kind of interested in this third uh, actor here, and that's the media. And uh, we're interested in these two, but particularly um, this, the relationship between the media and CEOs and TMTs. And if you look at it, so there's actually a, a growing literature on the media in public governance, and there are folks in finance who have been studying uh, media recognition and, and asset pricing. Uh, there are folks in accounting who have been studying uh, the effects of media on uh, corporate wrongdoing and the detection of fraud, and who the uh, and how the media uh, instructs fraud, and who they go after, and who they target. Does that targeting have any effect uh, on uh, accounting practices? And the media's role we think of is in three general ways: information dissemination, clearly just reporting, a fairly neutral way. What we call certification, which is kind of uh, pulling out uh, and saying you are good and you are bad, or you are worthy and you are not. And then status construction, they're very heavily involved in uh, creating status hierarchies. And we think of status hierarchies as kind of a ordinal ranking of individuals in some domain. And we're going to be talking about status hierarchies in the CEO domain. And, uh, our work, uh, the work of others, are suggesting that uh, the media has a, a fairly significant effect on things like CEO pay, uh, CEO labor market opportunities, uh, CEO performance, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about CEO malfeasance as well. And so the agenda today is we're going to talk a little bit about media coverage of CEOs and give you a background on some of the things that people have been finding. And we'll talk about the positive returns to status, which is, has been by far the dominant uh, approach and dominant uh, findings in the literature. Um, but then some anomalies that aren't easily explained by uh, positive return to status. Some evidence for negative returns, uh, our tentative way of pulling things together, and uh, then some possible extensions to put in this uh, MP study. Okay, so um, a lot of the research that's been done on CEO uh, status and CEO media has been was uh, has been using data from the 90s and early 2000s, and so have we. And uh, one of the one of the interesting things about that is that this was a period many people have said that it's a little bit contentious because uh, <laughs> other has, others have argued otherwise. But you seem and others have suggested that uh, the 90s were a period where CEOs were instructed to be larger than life. This was the era of the Jack Welch's and the Bernie Evers and so on and so forth. And um, different people have looked at uh, this phenomenon in different ways. Some of the articles in the press, some CEO certification contests, uh, which were uh, like CEO of the Year Awards. And uh, people have written books about top managers in uh, this era. And it's an era that's important because a lot of the research has been done on this particular era. So this is a, these are the findings. So just to go back to Usim's argument that uh, the 90s were somehow 
a, a, a period of uh, intense media co uh, coverage of CEOs. This is a paper by Park and Berger in 2004. And uh, they, they did a content analysis of uh, four media outlets. And they coded uh, headlines in, in these articles for whether or not the headlines contained mentions of CEOs. And uh, they, count, they just counted them. And you can see that uh, some of these, like the New York Times has been fairly stable. But in the three others, there's been kind of an increase. In the Wall Street Journal in particular, a dramatic increase in the number of articles written about CEOs over the decade of uh, 2000. Um, now, some have contested, but uh, others have not. And uh, they did a kind of an analysis of the valence of articles, too. And this is a common finding in the CEO press coverage literature that the typical article, the average article covering CEOs, is moderately positive on average. Uh, and here are some of the topics. Uh, most of the articles have something to do with CEO change. And uh, others uh, have to do with personal information, the so-called soft news, focus, it, uh, focus on personal life, family, interests, so on and so forth. Some company performance, um, salary benefits, we're going to get down here, stock price, and so on. And here are the dimensions mentioned. So there's, uh, the press focuses uh, quite a bit on the competence of CEOs <coughs> and uh, other personal uh, dimensions. It's interesting for those of you interested in uh, integrity and uh, ethics, it's not a huge topic of kids, uh, uh, in the CEO press coverage. Probably because it's kind of off, off uh, limits in terms of uh, discussing that. No, so that's one, that's one uh, way of measuring CEO um, media impact or media coverage and CEO celebrity. Here's another, uh, CEO of the Year Awards. And this is what we've been using. And um, there was a, a, a magazine called Financial World that had been around for quite a while. It went out of business in 1997, but until that time, from 1975 to uh, 1997, they ran an annual uh, CEO of the Year award contest, basically. And it was actually quite uh, systematic. It had uh, analysts and C other CEOs and in industries rank order of uh, CEOs in that industry. And then from that, they would choose a group of uh, bronze medalists. And from the group of 60 or so bronze medalists, they would choose 15 silver medalists. And from that group, they would choose the final gold medalist. And every year, in uh, March or so in New York City at the Plaza Hotel, they would have a big to-do about it and get the gold medal and bronze medal winners and silver medal winners who were trophies. And uh, Financial World was actually an early mover in the CEO of the Year Award contests. Um, but, uh, and, and they would judge it, uh, they were, the, the, the folks who were rating these CEOs were asked to use these four dimensions. Uh, but since that time, there have been a number of other uh, uh, publications that have come out with various kinds of CEO of the Year awards. And these rankings are kind of very interesting. And um, in general, there are a lot of rankings and a lot of these kind of contests. We call them certification contests because they're meant to kind of certify that there here is a rank ordering of competence in some ways. And uh, I don't know if you've ever read the book, uh, oh, I mean, of James English wrote the book, uh, uh, economy of prestige, and uh, he actually is looking at the uh, arts, uh, movies and uh, books, and, and fiction, and uh, he uh, kind of counted and analyzed all of the different uh, movie awards and book awards and so on, and has uh, shown that over time, the number of these awards has increased dramatically over the last 20 years. And in fact, now, he makes the point that now there are more movie awards than there are new movies coming out in the given year. <laughs> and uh, his, his point, though, is that these, uh, in, in areas where there are intangible assets, that uh, in order to create markets, 
you have to have some way of certifying quality. And uh, his argument is that as uh, art, the arts have become more and more market-like, uh, these awards have been uh, necessary to some extent, or at least they've been sought after. And uh, you can make a similar claim here as well. I think from a magazine's point of view, it's pretty clear uh, from the publication and sales numbers that I've seen, these are uh, some of the most, uh, uh, most subscribed to issues in these magazines. So it's, there's this kind of sales incentive as well. But um, many people have remarked, uh, maybe going back to Holmstrom's famous piece in the 80s, that CEOs are hard to evaluate, and this just feeds into the evaluation uh, process. And so uh, these are the different kinds of uh, magazine coverage, CEO of the year contests. And uh, here are the number of um, or, or some kind of award winners for, uh, at, over these different contests. And you can see this is when um, financial will dropped. Uh, business we kind of took over. Uh, Worth came in for a while, uh, for a few years, and then they dropped out. They went out of business. Industry Week has always chosen one CEO of the year, and so did Chief Executive Magazine. Uh, they still can choose one CEO. And uh, different people have used uh, different bits and pieces of these. So in a paper that I'll mention later by Martin Day and Tate, in uh, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, they, they summed up, they measured uh, the number of awards that a CEO won. We only focused our efforts on financial world, and our, our data are from uh, this earlier period. Um, but different people have used different combinations of this, as well as media coverage. And uh, despite the number of different contests, and you think a number of different uh, preference functions and so on among editors and those who are choosing, there is a fairly high degree of consensus uh, among uh, these, uh, these award, uh, these magazines, of who the best CEOs are at any given time. <coughs> and so these are just some of the, so Jack Welsh won a bunch of awards, and Larry Lawson, and Michael Eisner, and so on. Dick Welsh was one of the most decorated CEOs in his era, obviously. And then finally, uh, there have been books written about star CEOs. And I think this is the best one. This was published in 1999. Thomas Neff is the chairman of uh, Spencer Stewart, the large executive search firm. And uh, I think that they were kind of interested in using, they have proprietary databases on CEOs, and they were interested in using those and public, publicizing some of their findings from that. But this was actually a, a, probably the most careful selection of top CEOs that I've seen. They surveyed 500 uh, thought leaders like university presidents and uh, other CEOs and analysts and government leaders uh, to have them nominate who they thought were the best CEOs in America. And they used those results to call down uh, a group that they started using their own proprietary data on past history, company performance, and so on. And they chose the top 50 CEOs in US business at the time. This was in a book that was published in 1999. And they had a little blurb. They interviewed each one of these folks and wrote a book about, uh, had a kind of a chapter on each one. And you, would, you know, there are the, the folks that you would think, uh, Lou Gerstner, Jack Welsh, and so on and so forth. Now, how do you make sense out of this theoretically? Okay, and uh, this is where I think um, some of the sociology uh, comes in. And uh, a very famous paper by the sociologist Robert Merton published in Science Magazine in 1968, and he published an update in 1988. In 1968, he coined the term Matthew effect from the uh, gospel according to Matthew. I don't know if you remember the uh, episode where a very wealthy man uh, gave his, some of his slaves different amounts uh, of money based upon how much they, well, he, he gave them each the uh, same amount of money, came back a few years later, and those that had kind of increased their wealth, increased the money two or three times, he gave more to. Those who just kind of buried it in, uh, and didn't, didn't do anything with it, he kind of punished. And uh, the, 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 the conclusion here is, for unto everyone that hath shall be given, 
and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And so this was a way of encouraging initiative and the use of assets, basically. And uh, Merton took this, and uh, this is kind of a picture from uh, of the Matthew. Uh, this, this, uh, this parable. And um, Merton took this, and this comes out of the paper. This is a quote from the paper. And he was particularly interested in uh, status among academics, particularly scientists. And basically, he argued that, uh, he coined the term the Matthew effect as the accruing of greater increments of recognition for particular scientific contributions to scientists of considerable repute. And basically, he was pointing to something that we all kind of intuitively know that if you send their same paper in, it depends on whether the evaluation that uh, you get from a journal might depend on who the author of that paper is. And the same paper can be evaluated differently uh, depending upon who the author is. And uh, he pointed out uh, the funding structure of science, so that if you send the same proposal in, uh, a junior faculty member with very little reputation just getting going, and a Nobel Prize winner putting in the same proposal, uh, Funding sources are going to view the, uh, the latter as more uh, funding. And that's an example of an after effect. And you can think of it as um, kind of a positive returns to status in the sense that uh, because you're a high status actor, you get more of something just because that you're, you're of your status. And some have taken this, and uh, these are anthropologists, and they, they talk about difference amplification. This example of the Matthew effect is actually an example of difference amplification, where a kind of a random, it could even be a random uh, difference initially, gives people the confidence or the charisma or the reputation or something to attract more as they go along. And the more they get, the more attractive and confidence they become and the more they get beyond that. So there's actually kind of the uh, argument that the rich get richer in this difference amplification uh, argument. And there are differing uh, literatures. They all say the same thing. <coughs> so this comes from Robert Wright, uh, the anthropologist, the uh, book The Moral Animal. He talks about the deeply human need for status and the effect that status has, status hierarchies, have on societies. Sociologist uh, Joel Pagoni has talked about returns to quality. Higher status actors get higher returns because they're seen to be higher quality. Uh, the economists Frank and Cook have talked about winner take all effects, and they use various examples. So in sports, for example, there may be only a half a second difference between a gold medal winner and a silver medal winner. Literally, you know, virtually no difference. But yet the gold medal winner gets the spoils. Um, the anthropologist uh, Robert Sapolsky did an uh, analysis of the effects of status, uh, status hierarchies on stress across all non-human primate species. And one of the things that he finds is that there is generally a very positive association between um, the presence of a, of a primate in a status hierarchy and their health. And a number of people have looked at status diffusion and prestige by association. Not only do these, the rich get richer, but those associated with the rich might get richer as well. And uh, some of my favorite work is uh, by uh, economists on the economics of superstars. And a little debate between Rosen and Adler. Rosen suggests that uh, a, a small difference in um, your skill level, if, you're, if the market is big enough for your services and you're publicized enough in that market, then a small difference in ability could actually uh, create the superstar effects. And the debate is, uh, between him and Adler was that uh, Adler suggested that, that that difference doesn't even have to be due to ability. Just a random success <coughs> early on can lead to the accumulation of superstar status later, which I think is kind of an interesting uh, story because uh, it means that high status is o may only be loosely coupled with underlying quality, underlying ability in the CEO realm. And that's a theme that I'd like to come back to later. So anyway, self-reinforcing positive returns to status. 
So this would lead, if you take, if you take this argument, this would lead then to uh, uh, certain various, you know, certain predictions about uh, the effects of high status on the CPO and company outcomes, right? So a CPO track record of quality and, and a high status CEO at the helm might attract better labor, customers, suppliers, investors. Um, at one point, I think it's probably changed, but at one point, uh, when Steve Jobs was still CEO back a few years ago, the real worry was that his reputation was so good in the industry that he was accounting for about 20% of the market capitalization of Apple. And they had to really play that, play his exit really carefully in order to make sure that when he left, uh, they didn't lose $20 billion in market capitalization. Uh, there are attributions of the CEO being prime mover. And when uh, a company does something, uh, when you have a star CEO at the helm, it leads to the CEO being credited. The CEO's prestige and status might mean added value and more power, uh, more power to do a variety of things. For example, bargaining about their own pay and the pay of their top management team. And uh, media coverage might also play a larger role or a large role in creating uh, labor markets for CEOs and publicizing their accomplishments and giving them more job opportunities. So, we started out kind of just looking at this effect. What, what happens when a CEO gets star status for their outcomes and firm outcomes? And our initial uh, uh, sample and our initial study was over, uh, we used a, a sample of S&P 500 firms. And we looked at five years of data. And these are some of the companies in our sample. Uh, these are some of the um, well-known CEOs, but some not so well known CEOs. So we had a, a variety of folks, and uh, we were particularly interested in uh, firm outcomes, CEO outcomes, uh, TMT outcomes, their average total compensation, and also their promotion to CEO. So uh, we were interested in going back to uh, this, we were interested in kind of getting a measure of this, which was the Financial World CEO of the Year Conference, did they win any medals? How many red medals did they win? And uh, CEO pay and firm outcomes. These are some of the measures and uh, some of the independent variables. We, we looked at uh, if they won a medal in any given year, and then we just counted the uh, number of medals in the past five years. We looked at firm size, we looked at institutional ownership, industry market return, CEOs in your outside CEO, uh, whether they were an outside CEO when they became, uh, were, are they, were they external to the company before they became CEO, their age, whether they were a new CEO, a bunch of year dummies. A variety of different kinds of uh, regressions. But here's the finding that I want to kind of just talk a little bit about. So this is um, predicting their total pay, their total compensation from um, the Execucom database. And here's the interesting effect. You can see it back here. So this is whether they won a medal in a given year on their pay in that year, and the number of medals they won in the last five years. Okay, and you can see both of these are significant. So winning a medal in a given year increases their pay by about 10%. And every medal that they won in the previous five years, each of, each of those medals increases their total pay by about 5%. So uh, there's this really strong uh, effect on CEO outcomes. Uh, stars get paid more. And the more of a star they are, the more they get paid. And the effects accumulate over time. Yeah. Can I ask a question? How do you think about causality in this type of model? Maybe the guy, at one extreme, maybe the people who give the awards look to see which CEOs are making the most, and that goes into their discussion. Or maybe there, maybe there's an underlying factor, such as a CEO doing a great job, that both influences CEO pay and the, and the medals. How do you unpack those um, so they can make causality statements like this? Well, uh, we uh, control for uh, 
firm performance in this particular regression. So it's over and above firm performance. We control for industry performance as well. So if they're being compared to uh, somebody in their industry, uh, then that would control a little bit. But it's you know it's hard uh, to uh, rule out all these uh, you know endogeneity. Uh, but we try to do some things here. We try to do it. And the problem gets even more significant when, and I'll show later, when you start trying to predict performance. We kind of try to use uh, certain statistical techniques like Erlang or Bond regression to kind of in a lag to kind of measure way to kind of control the prior firm performance and you know that kind of correlated error. But uh, it's it's tough. It's a tough thing to do. Yeah. But also just in a simple way, you wouldn't expect a one year bump the year after the the award, right? So if it's if it's some underlying skill, you would have expected that to be a gradual increase over time or something that would perform the award. Yeah. But what what if the a new product is introduced? I mean think of Steve Jobs and the discontinuities he came up with one product and it suddenly came up with another product. So I don't know that it's necessarily a smooth process. I mean, there's this famous effect in sports called the Sports Illustrated effect. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who are on the, on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and then they tend to do not as well after that. Yeah. And it's obvious that's nothing but an endogeneity issue. Those guys received the award because they happened whether the random factors wanted to do better than the long run effects. And, and the causality is completely reversed. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem, but it, it's, it's hard to know what causes what it is. Yeah, and any kind of approach. I mean, so I'm going to, uh, you know, we can talk later about this paper by Martin David Tate, which was published a couple of years ago. And they could kind of try to overcome this problem using matching designs, using propensity score matching. But even that has problems, too. So I think we've concluded that the best thing that you can do is kind of look at the, uh, the constellation of findings and try to piece the, together the constellation of findings. Different people use different measures, different people use different approaches, and do you find any consistency across a number of different studies to have some, some confidence that there's something there? I think we have, but, I, but you're right, any given study is going to be causally a little bit ambiguous. Um, okay, so, so far the, uh, this argument about uh, positive returns to status in our minds, uh, was all well and good. Um, but uh, then we start. Th this, th then we started to find a, a certain anomalies, interesting issues in our data. And here's one of them. Okay, so um, this is a, a A B regression um, on um, looking at CEOs, uh, start, the effects of stardom, CEO stardom on firm performance. And uh, here are the interesting coefficients. You can see that if you win a medal this year, your uh, uh, subsequent year's performance drops. These are lag. Your subsequent year's performance drops. And it's even the case, um, yeah, so uh, this year your subsequent performance drops, although there's not an effect uh, for uh, five-year medal winners. And um, uh, we looked at this, and this is cumulative uh, annual returns from um, CompuStat. And then we did an, uh, an event analysis, and this was kind of looking at cumulative annual returns uh, around the time uh, that the award was announced in a given year, and then we kind of expanded the event window to different lengths, and um, used two different models. This market model uh, uses the firm's past performance as kind of the uh, the benchmark for computing uh, abnormal returns. But uh, you can see here that um, there are short-term positive effects, short-term positive effects, short-term cumulative, uh, positive cumulative annual uh, abnormal returns for days after the award is announced. But the longer you go out, the stronger the negative effect which kind of reinforces this other previous finding, uh, uh, <laughs> nearly thing. This is a daily cumulative abnormal return. And the effects start getting negative. So in other words, um, if you are singled out as a star CEO, you get paid more, but your firm subsequently does worse. Well, that's really an interesting anomaly. Um, because you say that, well, how can this happen? How can this happen? Uh, and how can it be sustained over time? Where's the self-reinforcing positive returns? 
what kind of returns are you talking about? There, market value? Yeah, these are stock. These are stock. For instance, uh, here is. Um, these are on a stock prices as well. You don't find the same effect for accounting returns. Profitability. I think we use the return on equity. So, and here, here are some of, of the most uh, celebrated CEOs in our sample. <laughs> Bernie Ebel, Ebers was one of the most celebrated CEOs uh, of his era. He's now serving 25 years in the federal penitentiary. And Dennis Koslowski uh, was, again, one of, the, one of the grand medal winners in our sample. And he's now serving eight years. Uh, in upstate New York penitentiary. Um, and some not so extreme cases. Michael Eisner, we, his name was up there when I showed you, he was pushed out by shareholder revolt led by uh, Roy Disney. And even, yes, even Jack Welch, America's number one manager, has suffered uh, an ignominious fate. Uh, a few years after he retired in 2001 from GE, uh, Fortune magazine ran a cover story basically saying, sorry, Jack. And this cover story was all about how his management methods had been discredited. Um, so, interesting, isn't it, that here you have these really superstar CEOs, that even the most superstar of the superstars, Jack Welch, it took him leaving, but then the knives came out. The knives came out. And look at this. Look at this. This is uh, Meth and Citron. Again, this was a very careful selection of the top 50 CEOs published in 1999. By 2009, 13 of them, or about 26%, had lost their jobs involuntarily. Some of them were in jail. Koslowski was there. Um, Ebers was in that set. Ken Lay was of uh, Enron was in that set, and others uh, less extreme were in that set as well. Uh, so here we have a really careful selection of the top CEOs. Yet 26% of them suffer ignominious fates as fallen CEOs uh, within the decade following their staff their uh, recognition. Where are the positive returns to staffs? That's sort of a question that we've been asking. And so we actually went back and we took a look at uh, the award winners for all of these different contests. And we coded the CEOs for the number of awards that they won uh, from 1993 to 2004. And we just simply counted them. Uh, just counted them. And uh, of all the CEOs who won one to two medals, about 7% of them suffered uh, involuntary uh, termination. Uh, for those who won three to four medals, about 14% were involuntarily terminated. And for those who are real superstars, having won five or more medals, some of them by 10 or 11, 12 medals over this period of time, 32% uh, 32, 32 of them were terminated from their jobs involuntarily. And just so as kind of a comparison benchmark, we took a hundred random, a sample of a hundred random non-metal winning CEOs just to see what their uh, baseline termination, involuntary termination would be. This would be the baseline termination of average CEOs. Um, and that's about 8% comparable to uh, this. Now these are just univariate findings, but you kind of wonder about it, don't you? I mean, where are the positive returns to status? And if Merton is right, he expects a, a different finding. And it makes it even more interesting that these guys are getting paid a lot of money. They're getting paid a lot of money, the company's performance drops, and um, they're involuntarily terminated. Some more interesting findings. Go ahead, yeah. Question for you, you're looking at media companies, and in other literatures it's called visibility or it's called legitimacy. So what does this say about organizational legitimacy or CEO legitimacy and the ability to legitimize? Um, well, I think status should co-vary with legitimacy. So I think uh, different, uh, I think there is kind of a collinear sort of relationship between legitimacy and status. High status actors are 
may be I mean, part of this effect is uh, has has to do with there being more legitimate perceived as more legitimate. But ultimately not. Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, so. There are a few different constructs in the literature, right? So reputation is one, status is another, legitimacy is another. Maybe you've seen the papers in AMR on this. Uh, I think people are trying to make a distinction between legitimacy and status. Uh, the distinction, which I think is pretty decent, is um, that status has to do with ordinal rankings. Not you know, ordinal rankings. That, there is a, that you're better. Legitimacy is just acceptability. But status has something to do with you're better. Now, so are, they co are, they co are they collinear? Probably. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, but nobody has really tested it out, right? right? right. And, and the other question that you're asking, the other part of your question is what's the relationship between corporate status and CDO status? That's another untested right. uh, uh, relationship. But it's not clear that it can be a Ralph's question, or there's multiple ways in which it must. <coughs> now, some, there are some indirect uh, people, there are people who have looked at it indirectly. So there was a, a, a sample, uh, there was a study done, a survey done by Burson Marsh, the PR firm. And the question that they asked people was, um, and they asked CEOs and analysts, what percentage of your company's reputation is based upon your company's CEO's reputation? And these guys said about 40%. So at least in the common uh, understanding, there's a difference. But it's really going to be hard to tease that out. Yeah? Thank you. Maybe it's an inverted U-shape relationship. And at the beginning, you have increasing returns and the winning of a medal marks the, the threshold where you start having decreasing results, results because you get busy being a superstar as opposed to making efforts that actually make you a superstar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's where we're going to go a little bit further. And uh, we'll get to it because I think that's kind of Marvin Gaye and Tate's argument. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, so I'm wondering if there could be a risk story in here too. The, the, the top CEOs take a lot of risks. And so they're sampling when they're choosing the, the, the winners, they're, the, they're choosing people who took a lot of risk and therefore they got really high returns. They're the small percentage that got the high returns. And those people continue to make a lot of risks and therefore they fall later. So CEOs are of a type that they just take a lot of risks and so you're sort of randomly picking the, the people who the, the risk turned out the first time, but inevitably with risk taking, they're gonna, you know, a lot of them are in falling. So it's kind of a uh, kind of a mean reversion. These yeah. guys they became successful because of because of their risk taking, and yeah. they also fall because of their risk taking. Yeah. And then the first sample of winners are just the ones who the risk paid off initially, and so you're kind of sampling on that. I think risk has something to do with it, but I'm not quite necessarily sure that mean reversion. Because a lot of these studies, including ours, we we controlled for prior years' performance, which would be I, you argue would control a little bit for mean reversion. Uh, but yeah, I think risk is an, is an interesting variable. We'll come back to it in a minute because I think it does play, but maybe in a little bit of a different way. Um, so let me just get through this a little bit before. So here's a here's a um, a paper by uh, my student Yuri Machina who um, studied the relationship between corporate performance. Now they were looking at corporate status, not CEO status, but corporate status and corporate crime in a sample of U.S. manufacturing firms, and and they found that it was the better performing firms that were more likely to commit corporate crimes. <laughs> and this effect was amplified for high status firms. And they define high status as those who were listed on the Fortune 500 most admired corporations list. Now again, there's a difference between, I think, between CEO status and uh, corporate status. But it's an interesting finding nonetheless. If the most high status corporations and the better performing ones are actually more likely to commit crime. And they defined it as, uh, they went back and looked at uh, corporate, corporate crime records and what corporations uh, were united or whatever. Um, and uh, here's a parallel study to ours uh, by Marmon Day and Tate. And this is the study that did matching. They, they did uh, a little bit of matching. They're probably a little bit more careful than our study. We tried to get, get around it through Econometrics. They wanted. They did it through uh, matching, and um, they studied CEO of the year winners from '75 to 2002, and uh, with a, a strong emphasis on the sample over 1992. And they found that um, medal-winning CEOs compared to a matched sample of non-medal winners, they were paid more. We found that, 
they had a greater TMT, uh, they had a greater sl uh, slice of the TMT pay pie, and we found that too. Um, but they're more likely to write a book about themselves. <laughs> they're more likely to sit on other boards. They're more likely to manage earnings. Now they define earning, ma earnings management not as accruals, but as hitting targets. The closer you are to hitting the target, they argue that the more you are managing earnings. And like us, they found that firms had uh, for uh, managing, being managed by status CEO, you perform more poorly. Okay. So yep. does maybe Yermax work fit into any of this at all? A little bit in the sense uh, Doug, that uh, he shows kind of a decoupling of CEO performance and pay. Okay. And I think that's what he's basically showing. And I haven't read his studies, but I've read the stuff he's written in the Wall Street Journal about how, like, when you get famous, you are more likely to invest in, you know, have your own airplane and invest in all of these things that, you know, I think he argues just mean, like, you became a star and now you spend money like a star and you're no longer thinking about the organization. But he doesn't measure startup, I don't think. That's probably right. Um, he measures just CEOs. Yeah. Um, so these folks, though, they're, they're kind of, and, and how do they explain this? Well, they use this concept of CEO disease. And it fits, right? It fits with the pattern. So the argument goes something like this. You perform well, and all, all the studies that have been done suggest that you have to perform well to become a star. Maybe not necessarily because you're good, but your firm has to perform well. Um, you become a star. You get paid a ton of money, and then you start getting distracted. Like this, for you, that's, this is what you are doing. You start getting distracted. You start writing books. People want your, a piece of you. They want, uh, they want you on their boards. They, you sit on uh, charitable foundations, and so on and so forth. And uh, you start losing sight of, you take your eye off the ball. You start feeling like maybe you're a bit, uh, well, I, I can do that. I've, been, I've succeeded in the past, and then I'll be able to do this uh, with, the, with less work in the future. And, and depending upon how you want to how you want to slice the CEO disease, you can see it as a very pernicious kind of thing, where the CEO is extracting rents from their fame uh, beyond uh, their marginal value to the firm, or you can see it as kind of an incident of just being famous and not having the time to keep your eye on the ball. But there's an interesting little twist here. It comes from our data. And it's this. This is the same regressions. And we uh, interacted the number of winners, number of medals that you won in the past, the CEO won in the, won in the past, with their return on equity and their, their market return. And uh, here's what we found here. Not, uh, we didn't find in a yeah, we found an effect for a return on equity. Uh, there's a positive interaction between the number of medals that you won and um, your return on equity uh, and the relationship between return on equity and CEO pay. In other words, uh, the effect of your firm's profitability on your pay is amplified when you're a star. So that if you do, if your firm does well, you get paid more than non-stars, but if your firm does poorly, you get paid less than non-stars. So this is a little bit of a twist because it's saying, wait a minute, your, your pay and performance are more closely tied together when you're a star. Joe, uh, yeah. does that, uh, is it the contemporary as we can do? Is the same theory as we can? Right. This is what the contemporary. So uh, maybe better insights can be learned from temporary as we can to come forward to the data patterns. And it could, to make, uh, it could be that only they get more pay when the company is doing well, but they don't get paid less. And I can take the get less when the company is doing poor. Is the something to be separated positive and negative performance? Yeah. To see if uh, that interaction effect occurs only the positive side rather than not the negative side. Well, uh, we looked at the we graphed the interaction, we kind of computed the inflection point, and it's not a very severe one. The inflection point is zero. So <laughs> As long as you're making money, you're going to benefit. But it's if you lose money, 
that's when you get hit a little bit. Uh, but the hurdle is not very high. I mean, it's basically you know, making money, positive money. Now, uh, so this is very interesting. This, this actually uh, is a result that's uh, similar to a paper in the Journal of Financial Economics by Todd Milburn, where he showed that for CEOs that have higher press coverage, and he claims uh, in his study to have done a, a kind of a test of whether the press coverage was positive or negative. And uh, again, CEO press coverage tends to be either neutral or positive. So, Counting the number of articles is really an indication of whether you're getting positive coverage in the news. But he found that for those CEOs who have higher press coverage, their pay for performance sensitivity is tighter. And uh, there's a difference between stars and non-stars of about $10 in CEO pay per 1,000 of shareholder value. That's what he computed. Yeah. Joe, okay. if you go back to the data, yes, um, model three, four, and five, the assets, the size, which is also visibility in other literatures or legitimacy in other literatures, which is wrong, but be that as it may, um, the log of total assets, the size, also kicks in as important for models three, four, and five when you start doing interactions. What's the story going on there? How does that play with the size of the firm and the individual CEOs? Again, is that legitimacy, visibility, reputation, status, sort of confoundedness? Mm, don't know, actually. Uh, but uh, it could be that uh, one of the, you know, as you might know, one of the one of the greatest, uh, strongest findings in the CEO compensation literature is that the bigger the firm, the higher the CEO pay. And it could be that there's something going on uh, between the status and uh, total assets that I maybe mean, obscure okay. some of that okay. or I, other models. I don't know. But, um, it's also the case that uh, you win, you tend to win more awards if you manage larger firms. So there are some interesting things going on between those variables. Right, right. And that's consistent with the literature and the different constructs. So Milburn found that, in fact, paper performance sensitivity is significantly higher than uh, And this uh, it was replicated in a, a paper by Karuna uh, as well. And uh, this paper, this is a finance paper, uh, also by uh, Milburn's uh, co-author on this paper as well. And these guys uh, traced uh, star CEOs brought in to turn around a company and found that uh, they're more likely to be fired. Yeah, go ahead. And do you think this has anything to do with the fact that these people are now under greater scrutiny? So they've won these awards, they're supposed to be top of the game. Now, every next step is being much more closely scrutinized, not only by the public, but by you know shareholders or other members of the top management team in a way that um, non-metal winners or non-superstars, they're obviously still being watched, but they're not necessarily under the microscope as much. And so any slight misstep is amplified much more significantly so than if you're obviously not being so closely scrutinized. Well, I think that's what we're doing. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's part of the story. Uh, and I think what's interesting is I think a lot of these things are part of the story. We'll get to, we'll get to that in a minute. And some recent studies show a positive relationship between, not, uh, but uh, going back to the uh, data, so some studies do in fact show a positive relationship between CEO celebrity and firm performance. Uh, Cove uh, published a paper in an accounting journal looking at earnings quality as measured by pools and found a positive uh, effect, uh, but for the first metal one. Uh, Falati et al. in that same study actually showed a positive stock reaction to hiring a star CEO in a turnaround situation. There's a short-term positive effect. We found a short-term positive effect. So there are some short-term positive effects that come from uh, hiring or having a star CEO at the helm. And this is an accounting paper uh, by Jennifer Francis and others and they found evidence for lower earnings quality for celebrity CEOs, but they did kind of a simultaneous modeling, and they were able to kind of provide some evidence suggesting that it wasn't the star CEO who uh, uh, creates uh, negative, uh, uh, creates uh, poorer earnings quality. It's poor earnings quality that uh, leads to star CEOs being brought in to turn around the firm. So there are these really interesting uh, uh, different kinds of effects going on that kind of make sense of. Star CEOs are brought into poor performing firms to turn them around, but a lot of you all are saying that if they don't do well, they're more likely to be fired than if they were promoted from internally. 
And finally, we found in another paper that uh, TMT members who work for star CEOs are more likely to be promoted to CEO, either within that firm or to get a CEO position in another firm. Now, if you say there's uh, really rent extraction and CEO hubris and uh, malfeasance going on, why would, star C why would the lieutenants of star CEOs get promoted? So it's a really complicated set of findings in this literature. We have arguments about positive returns to status. We show certain positive returns to status, CEO pay, and short-term firm performance. But longer-term performance, um, we don't. And we also find positive returns for members of the top management teams. There is status by association here. So let's kind of build up something else here, and looking at uh, some underlying uh, uh, forces that might be at work, and this uh, is, goes back to the Matthew effect, and uh, this is Merton again, put in less stately language, the Matthew effect consists in improving of greater increments of recognition for particular scientific contributions to scientists of considerable repute. Do we have a little bit of Yeah. Okay. Of considerable repute. But in the very next statement, here's what Matthew says, uh, here's what Merton says, and the withholding of such recognition from scientists who have not yet made their mark. And uh, an often ignored part of Merton's argument here is that the Matthew effect is actually a double injustice. Uh, high status actors sometimes get more than they deserve based upon their performance, while simultaneously low status actors sometimes get less. I mean, think about the young faculty member putting in a proposal to the NSF, and he doesn't have any track record, and that very, but the proposal might be very cutting edge, and so on and so forth, but the, the proposal of the Nobel Prize winner may get funded in human not. And that's what essentially. And so the Nobel Prize winner feels a little bit guilty, maybe, but this young faculty <coughs> feels a little bit pissed off because of that double injustice. And if this, uh, if this is happening over time, the richer getting richer, what's happening to the folks who are trying to make their mark? Yeah? Isn't it possible that there's a simple story that when the NSF and whoever is evaluating these proposals, they know the Nobel Prize or winner can actually carry out the project. Whereas the new person, there's uncertainty. So this might be simply an information story. And that in order, just like, in, just like being a junior faculty member in a tenure track institution, you have to, in effect, be underpaid or work overly much in order to demonstrate providing information that you can do it, and then you collect the rents afterwards. And I, I, I'm not clear how that's really injustice. So you would wait, say, wait, wait, are you saying that I'm going to, so it's not injustice to be underpaid and underrecognized? <laughs> <laughs> this is true in law firms also. No, I just want to know. <laughs> 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 no, but so you're saying that the assumption that NSF would make as a Nobel Prize winner is still on top of his game, and he can do the grant, he can perform it, as this opposed to as opposed to what we just found that Nobel that uh, people who are of high status might be distracted, taken away, uh, taken away from their work. Uh, they work in big labs. They never spend much time in their labs anymore, and so on and so forth. As opposed to a young, hungry junior faculty member who needs to get that grant and needs to get those papers out in order to have tenure. Notwithstanding all your comments, I, I, that's exactly what I think. Because the other the, when you talk about these medals, you're conflating the media as an industry with the accomplishments of these people. Once you mix those two things together, almost anything is possible. Whereas when, if we're looking at, for example, some of these other studies of CEOs have looked at things that are not dependent on the media, um, such as just such as their pay, and whether they're overpaid or not is a separate issue. Here you're mixing up the media. So once you get the end of the in the media, I don't think it's comparable to the, to the NSF. But it's mixing up the media, and the media is his indication of status, right? So that's the truth. No, no, but, but that variable reflects the media as much as it does the CEO. Absolutely, but yeah. it doesn't matter, right? So it, assuming the media is random, that's actually what he wants. Is that the, man, the, the media randomly picks these people, and they actually didn't have any... But the media isn't random. The media has to sell copies of magazines. And so yeah. they're going to ch choose the people who they think will sell the most magazines. I think it's not random at all. And, and in some sense, the NFX and NSF... Well, the financial world, I think, is a little more systematic. I mean, they want to sell, but they put together this uh, fairly systematic, and certainly natural, and uh, nothing citron uh, 
as well, uh, with a little bit more systematic too. But so it's, it's I not admit to being on panels reviewing proposals and asking the question, can this person carry out the work and looking at the person's previous record? I totally agree with that, but I think you're attacking the analogy and not the study. No, no, it's only the analogy, it's not the study. I, I don't I'm uncomfortable with the idea that it's automatically injustice. It may be injustice, but just the fact that that just the two statements there are not equivalent to injustice. So Merton goes on to say, eminent scientists, <laughs> eminent scientists give just disproportionately great credit for their contributions to science, while relatively unknown scientists tend to get disproportionately little credit for comparable contributions. And in this paper, Merton uh, uh, provides a number of examples of uh, eminent scientists feeling really guilty about this. And they try to bring junior faculty in on the projects and so on and so forth, so they can kind of equalize things. But there's this double injustice that he points to. And in fact, he goes further to say, and this goes back to the uh, expectations that you mentioned, what appears from below to be the summit becomes in the experience of those who reach it only another way station. The scientists, peers, and other associates regard each of his scientific achievements as only the prelude to new and greater achievements. Such social pressures do not often permit those who climb the rugged mountains of scientific achievement to remain now we're going to call this expectation ratcheting. But uh, Merton's argument is that because of this double injustice, high status actors are really feel under pressure to continue to perform. Uh, and there have been some other studies, I want to rush through this stuff because I want to get to the, uh, to the um, uh, MP study. But so we, we kind of focus on this issue of the tall poppy. And uh, the tall poppy is an especially well-paid, privileged, or distinguished person. And the tall poppy syndrome is a tendency to discredit or disparage those who have achieved notable wealth or prominence in public life. And uh, certain folks have uh, studied the tall poppy effect uh, pretty significantly. Norman Feather, a social psychologist in Australia, um, has studied uh, the tall poppy effect quite a bit. But here's an example of it, right? This is a this is from uh, the technology writer of USA Today. This was published in 2006. Uh, sometime in 2006, Steve Jobs will probably get hosed. That's not so much a prediction as it is playing the odds. Nobody in America gets such a long ride on the oh, we so adore you bandwagon. Da -da -da -da. The only sure thing is that society, as if striving for equilibrium, will then knock Jobs down as fast, as far as we boosted him up. It's just what we do. So they're kind of uh, playing on this notion of the tall poppy as an equilibrium counterforce to the rich get richer uh, positive return dynamic or difference amplification. And people have studied, so for example, Norman Feather, tall poppy effects are particularly strong when status is viewed as undeserved. Uh, ben Cole uh, at uh, Fordham has uh, published a paper on targeting of elites is more likely when a transgression is very public. Uh, Batia Wiesenfeld, a colleague of mine, uh, has written about how social arbiters pile on uh, to high status actors. And Huggy Rao and a few others have, have, have published a paper on uh, how stigmatization uh, 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 diffuses and diffuses more rapidly than positive status uh, diffusion. And so, you know, our resolution is sort of like this, and it's a, kind of a long paper, but it kind of integrates what the folks were saying, and I, I think we have uh, we kind of pieced together these bits and pieces. It goes like this. Here's our story. Uh, there are some status precursors that people have found. Ability, visibility, earning stability, charisma, and luck. Uh, these lead to uh, initial star benefits in the short term, one to three years out. This is where the Matthew effect happens. And there's a positive bump on the firm performance and pay, CEO pay, and startup, media attention. About 15%, our data and others' data suggest that about 15% of these initial stars, who really win medal for a year, about 15% of those become superstars and win multiple medals over multiple years. And that's where the real problems are, start to arise, when the ex expectations start to ratchet up as Merton um, start to get a little bit overconfident because uh, you've been succeeding for a few years and people are telling you how great you are. You start to get a little bit riskier in your choices. Uh, at the same time, your top management team members are being picked off. Right? And 
Uh, there's been some studies done in social psychology on the higher the status actor, the less feedback they get from lower status actors in the organization. So your feedback is starting to dry up, and people aren't willing to call you out anymore. You start getting distracted from external duties, and you start engaging, in order to deal with these pressures, expectations are ratcheting, yet you're losing your best people. Um, it's not good enough anymore to just be profitable. You have to be really profitable. You start taking risky choices and you move into what Michelle Antony has called gray zone behaviors. These are behaviors that may be partially acceptable, especially in your firm, but from another perspective, may be or at least easily critiqued. Okay, easily critiqued. <clears throat> um, and these gray zone behaviors are really kind of interesting. Gary Fine, the sociologist at Northwestern, he's written about scandals. And his, his argument is that a scandal is always created when two different belief systems rub up against one another. Uh, you have a, a corporate belief system within the company that's saying, it's okay to do this. We've, but we've been doing it all the time. Uh, and nothing's wrong with it. We've actually had uh, Arthur Anderson come in and tell us that we're doing okay. We've actually talked to the SEC and they've given us their uh, permission to do this. So said the folks at Enron. But uh, from an outsider's point of view, this stuff is really scummy. Once, but in order to deal with these issues, then you start getting volatility. Volatility in earnings, ambiguity in the quality of your earnings, maybe poor earnings, and markets don't like poor earnings, and they don't like volatility in earnings. And so you start getting added pressure on you. And not only that, so it can lead you back to more growth gray zone behaviors, but it also starts to um, ratchet up tall poppy inclinations by external evaluators who are really looking to cut you down. Whistleblowers within the company who are pissed off that you've gotten all the credit for the success and they've been toiling away of, uh, uh, in, in anonymity for many years. And this is where you get the fallen CEO, pressure to fall. And so you, you, it's, it's a, a complicated story, but you get initial star status, something going on here, leading to something here through a complicated accumulation and a social process. So go ahead, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering why it's necessarily a bad thing to be terminated for a CEO. Uh, you haven't talked about severance packages. Severance uh, packages. Yes. And uh, it doesn't seem to be linked in your analysis. So um, how would that interfere or change results or anything? Um, so are you asking um, maybe it's good to be fired? In some cases it could be. For the CEO? Yes. You think they want to be? I mean, I think there's I a... I don't know. They, they might. It would be a legitimate question because they make a ton of money on the Yeah. I mean, I think, like, take Jack Walsh, for example. He retired, got a, a huge retirement settlement, uh, but left you know, with his reputation intact. Somebody like Bernie Evers not only uh, didn't get a retirement package, but he uh, was thrown in jail. And he lost all of his wealth. Uh, yeah. So I mean, those are the extreme cases. But there are middle ground. There is a middle ground. I mean, those are the two extreme cases, right? There is a middle ground where I think where you might be arguing that it could be actually better for a CEO to be terminated because they're going to get a better package. But you have to uh, you know, factor in their reputational loss as well. And I don't know what the trade-off would be there for us. Yeah. Yeah. But there's another case of termination, which is not a termination. But the case of Paulson became uh, Secretary of the Treasury and made tons of money thanks to that because yeah. he could sell the full taxes for yeah. his shares in government. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, interesting. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Also, yeah. would be a person all that. Yeah. So I have a related question to that, and has to do with the resigned and fired part. The disgrace seems to be something that's you know, sort of a social phenomenon. So to the extent that you're more prominent, you're more likely to be disgraced simply because 
somebody who's anonymous, the media doesn't disgrace, right? They might be fired, they might resign, they aren't necessarily disgraced. But what's the baseline comparison on the resigned and fired of star CEOs versus just general CEOs? Because I would expect that, I understand you sort of were giving some, some numbers in terms of how disgraced they were thrown in jail or something, but just on resigned and fired, it seems like that's something that happens to CEOs after X number of years, and if you compare it to those that were never prominent, are the numbers that different? Well, I showed them a little bit earlier, right? So the baseline that we computed on a random sample of non-star CEOs was about 8%. 8% of non-star CEOs get uh, involuntarily turned away from their job okay. but for one the, reason or another. But then the resign, I guess that maybe I'm getting caught up with having resigned there as being, it's sort of similar to Isabel, but I can imagine fired sounds bad. I, I'll say that some yeah. CEOs don't want, but resigning sounds like, you know, that could be any number of things. It could be coming to Secretary of Treasury. It could be cashing out and getting a lot of, you know, a, to, to a, somebody who's bought you out or something, yeah. it could be anything. So I'm not yeah, sure it's a little bit ambiguous thing. what an involuntary turnover is, yeah. and so there's always a little bit of a, uh, uh, there's always a little bit of an ambiguity, uh, interpretation. But we kind of uh, drew from inspiration from there's a fellow in finance, Perico Bob Perino, who has, uh, you, has come up with this measure of involuntary. So when you say resign, you mean involuntarily resign, pressure to resign. Yeah, pressure to resign. Okay. Yeah, pressure to resign. And as long as I have the floor, I'll just sort of reiterate that I, I, I see you have the, the risky choices in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that there, it could well be that they're actually the precursor is risk, but only you know only the successful ones are being captured in your measure, and the unsuccessful risks just never even show up in your Yeah, so that's just, just yeah. Some really interesting work on overconfidence that's happening now, and this is a really interesting uh, set of findings that we review in the paper. Uh, that uh, CEOs who have been successful in the past, they tend to um, they tend to overinvest in pet projects using internal cash flow rather than external capital markets. And uh, the argument that some folks have made uh, to explain that effect is that they overestimate the probability of payback in a successful project. I'm and wondering also if that gray zone behavior could also be a precursor. It's not found out. Yeah. But and it may be, I, I could imagine just in general probably the criminology research would show that it just people become more and more, you know, sort of stronger, you know, darker and darker gray as they move forward, as they are caught. So you could imagine also a precursor being gray zone behavior and then it becomes worse and worse, you know, interacting with overconfidence. Or the same behavior in retrospect yeah. uh, looks, is uh, slammed. Yeah, or it's slammed because you're prominent, right? Yeah. So it's getting yeah, back to just the, the prominence draws attention to the gray zone behavior. And maybe every CEO is engaging in this stuff and they aren't paying attention to yeah. So the fundamental tension that we see here is um, that uh, self-reinforcing positive returns to status, self-reinforcing negative returns, this kind of accumulation of backlash that is fueled by prominence is the two forces that work here. So on the one hand, you have the forces that work of saying, uh, give, give, give more to the high status actor. But on the other hand, you have this, what we would argue is, double injustice fuel backlash going against the same effect. And the two are going head to head to head. And the literature in corporate governance is really messy because it's hard to tease out all these things. And so what we wanted to try to do was actually see if we can find an effect of status. And not uh, necessarily status based upon performance, but just status in general, social status. And if we could find uh, a context to, to test out uh, this kind of targeting, we're particularly interested in seeing if we can isolate targeting. And it's hard to do in a corporate governance context for the same reasons that many people have been uh, arguing here, the endogeneity of these different processes. So we hit upon um, this uh, scandal, this expense scandal in the parliament, UK parliament. And, um, I don't know if you uh, know much about it, but you've been following it. Uh, but it goes something like this. Here's the timeline. In May 2005, uh, there was a parliamentary election, and Labor won uh, the government. And um, over the next uh, four or five years, it, uh, in, in the UK Parliament, uh, UK uh, MPs are able to charge various expenses to the government to run their offices and other kinds of things. And they're also able to uh, charge a second home, a uh, second home, uh, particularly if they live uh, further away from London. The idea here is that if you live away from London, you have to be in London so much that uh, charging a second home is legitimate. 
Uh, now, there was no residency requirement. You didn't have to show residency at one place or another, but uh, um, you, you could charge a second home. And the other couple of other context factors, uh, is, uh, MPs, the, the, the ethics rules in the, in the parliament were very lax because there was a sense that this was a gentlemanly kind of activity. And so nobody was, there was really very, very poor internal controls for these expenses. And uh, so there was a growing awareness uh, among some watchdogs, parliamentary watchdogs, that the, uh, these expenses should be made public over that decade. Uh, 2000, I mean, over the last, over those five years, uh, from 2005 to 2009. And uh, around uh, 2009, the government finally relented and agreed to make these expenses public, but they were going to redact all personal information. And so they actually set up an operation in downtown London with a group of people who were going through PDF files of these expense reports and redacting all personal information. And it's really an interesting story. These guys were so incensed about what they were reading that one of them actually took the uh, master file and gave it to the Telegraph, a newspaper in London, and said, here, disclose. <laughs> and they talked about different ways of disclosing so that it was fair and one party wasn't targeted and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, so this was an unexpected full disclosure, unredacted, all personal information. And um, it was unexpected. This happened in May uh, of 2009. And these guys were really caught, the MPs were caught kind of flat-footed there. And uh, my favorite example is the guy who uh, charged to have his uh, moat clean. He got pilloried in the house for having his, charging his uh, moat clean. Anyway, when they started, when they when they uh, published this stuff in 2009, the public, the UK public, just went crazy. It was a feeding frenzy. <coughs> and uh, by uh, in a couple of weeks, by May 19th, there was a formal inquiry inquiry that was launched by the Parliament, and they they uh, appointed Sir Thomas Legg, who was considered to be kind of a neutral, uh, career-long bureaucrat. Uh, who, was who was retired, and they brought him back from retirement to uh, head this commission. And they went through each MP's expense reports page by page and made a decision about whether or not it was justified or not, whether a dollar amount was justified or not. And the big, the big question was these second home expenses and whether they were justified or not. And it turns out that certain, C uh, certain MPs were playing, uh, playing around with these numbers charging some interesting things, like moat cleaning. Although he probably was more justified than some others, who had been uh, double, double charging for their mortgage and other kinds of things. So they published, uh, the leg report came out in December 2010, and a report was published with amounts that MPs were required to repay. And if you read this report, it's fairly neutral. They're not making a whole lot of judgment calls, except there's one category called unnecessary expenses. Uh, like this moat. Um, but they really tried to be fair and impartial. And then in May 2010, there was an election, and uh, the la Labour was uh, let, let, uh, pushed out, and there was a coalition government between the Conservatives and uh, the uh, Liberal Democrat Party. Now, so what we're, we were interested in this is um, this May election. And if you go through this, right, and you get caught with your hands in the cookie jar, so to speak. Do you make it past, do you get elected uh, in the next election? Or do you make it through the next election? Our measure is simply turnover, whether the MP made it through to the, uh, to the new parliament or not. And that's because of the politics there. They're, it's hard to kind of tease out whether they were voted out or whether they were just pushed out by the party. So we kind of just use turnover as the measure. And these are the variables that we're kind of interested in party affiliation, the vote margin back here. Uh, if they won by a lot, does that protect them here? Uh, their, par their parliamentary tenure, there's some evidence in the uh, uh, political science literature that uh, the longer you're in parliament, the more likely you are to kind of play loose with the rules. Their age, 
the distance of their home district from London, because that plays into the second home kind of thing, their salary, which is kind of a measure of status uh, in the parliament a little bit, the total of their claimed second home expenses over that period, the amount of repayment that was requested by leg over that period, whether they're their peers or not, these are the status measures, uh, whether they are peers, whether they're lords, and their uh, ed education, whether they had a, a dummy, Oxbridge education or not. These are our two status measures. And we measure press visibility, just a number of articles about them prior to the scandal and after the leg report came out. So we're really interested in these status measures and controlling for some of these things, whether we can predict turnover here. Okay? And let me just show you. These are really preliminary results. I hope you can see. But let me just walk you through. This is a logistic regression. Remember, the, the uh, dependent variable is a 1-0 turnover. They, they were made it through the, from the 55th, 54th to the 55th parliament. So this is their margin. And the, the, the coefficient says uh, basically that if you uh, won by a large margin in the previous election, you're, more, uh, you're less likely to turn over, essentially. Um, if you have more tenure in Parliament, you're more likely to turn over. If you have an Oxbridge education, it has no effect on whether or not you're likely to turn over. The farther away your district is from London, the more likely you are to turn over. If you're in labor, you're more likely to turn over. And this was the biggest loss in the labor, uh, this was the biggest loss of uh, seats by labor in um, 80 years. Uh, because the public was just incensed by the scandal. Uh, conversely, if you're a conservative, you're more likely uh, to stay on, you're less likely to turn over. Uh, here's the amount that the leg had them repay. And it had no effect on turnover. Being asked to repay by leg seemingly had no independent effect on whether or not they made it through the, to the next uh, parliament. This is the strongest effect. The more they charged the second home expenses, the more they made it, the less likely they were to stay on uh, the next parliament. The more likely they were to turn over. This is press reports prior to the lay, <coughs> has no effect. But the more articles that were published about you after the scandal, the more likely you are to turn over. Here is whether, oh, here's your salary. The more, like, the more that you were paid, the less likely you were. So this is kind of a measure of parliamentary status. And here is another one, uh, uh, status variable that we're interested in, whether or not you're a member of the peer, whether you're a lord or not. And if you're a lord, you're less likely to turn it over. Now here are two interaction effects that are particularly interesting. The first one has nothing to do with status but it does confirm uh, suspicions and kind of provides face validity to uh, this, this, uh, this model. This is an interaction between how far away your district is from London and your second home expenses. And uh, it's, it simply says that if you're close in and you charge a lot uh, to your second home expenses, you're going to be much, uh, you're, you're going to turn over. Um, you're more likely to turn over. So you're being penalized for charging unnecessary second home expenses. And here's the, here's the fact that we're particularly interested in. It's an interaction between um, the uh, peer, the peer status and the amount that leg asks the MP to be pay. And it's a positive interaction effect. It simply says that uh, uh, if you are a member of the peer, a dollar of repayment request has a bigger impact on, on turning over. And so even though peer has a positive, peer has a protective effect, main effect, and leg repayment has no main effect, the interaction effect is actually quite, you know, fairly strong. So being a high status MP um, gets you nicked a little bit more if you're asked to repay. Go ahead. Actually, so this might be able to give some evidence of your first hypothesis, which is what happens when you become famous. And 
you see in the data that the people who are more prominent are actually potentially also more likely, I don't know if it is over is overconfidence, but potentially more likely to charge on this account and you know maybe like evidence on malfeasance or so on. So that's actually I think you know this might be even a better data where you can figure out some of those things. And do you find any evidence? It that? turns out that peers actually do have higher second home expenses. They do charge more. Um, so, uh, but this is controlling for that, so it's over and above that effect. So, to some extent, there is that effect. And the guy with the moat is actually an interesting story. He, after the fact, he got pilloried and he lost his seat. Um, but he claimed that uh, the reason why he charged the moat expense was that he wanted to be completely open about it, about what he was being, what he was charging for. And he uh, interpreted it in exactly the opposite way, that this was, he was being open, and he was getting penalized for being open, rather than being penalized for an unnecessary expense. I mean, he's a wealthy lord. Um, hey, he's got a mood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just two quick things. You know, part of this is also dependent on timing. You know, when you get caught if you're wealthy, or presumed wealthy, and you have hands and you get caught in your hands a cookie jar, and the world is going through the worst financial crisis and this retraction in the economy, you you will see an amplification of turnover, I assume. It's one of those. And the second, a natural progression of something like this would be, would you go ahead and then slice it by industry? Because I think stardom, star status in different industries would lead you to perhaps a different conclusion. And then on the final, and then Isabel was in sort of Alluding to that, the finance sector, it's yeah. a little bit different than those packages different. and so forth, as opposed to, say, somewhere in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. The star factor is a whole different ballgame. In fact, going to jail might increase your earning power. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, uh, so uh, just to end up here, uh, you know, we're really talking about this kind of um, this yin and yang, right? And I think what you're asking is uh, uh, does, our, does the weight shift between the left side and the right side, depending upon a whole variety of circumstances. We have a couple of things here like CEO personalities. There's been some evidence in the CEO literature for narcissism. You would think that narcissistic CEOs who are attention getting would be particularly susceptible uh, to these kinds of things. Um, governance structure. So Marvin Dan Tate found that these status effects happen only if the governance structure in the firm is weak. So you would think that maybe there would be some moderator effects for governance. You're suggesting maybe different industries would tend to have. That's a really interesting hypothesis. Maybe different industries. And if an industry has become stigmatized, does it make it easier to go after uh, CEOs in that industry, like the financial services? Um, so yeah, I think all of that is really kind of an interesting question. So I just like to kind of uh, then uh, and, uh, the two sides of status. Uh, should you be happy or sad if Doug calls you up and says you've been uh, mm -hmm. singled out as the best teacher in uh, George Washington University? Uh, our results suggest that, um, again, uh, you should at least pause and give some thought to it. <laughs> 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 Thanks, this is Martha Stewart. Who I think, was really the unnecessarily. Uh, so this is a hot tall poppy. Yeah. Uh, Martha Stewart was a top poppy. Yeah. 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 Thanks so much. Uh, really yeah. 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 Yeah.